So um, we can take some questions, some comments, some contributions um, to the speakers. So take the opportunity also as they have come from far to share their experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one myself actually uh, uh, to the speakers, not talking about failure, but about success. What is about the percentage of success being the uh, micro gardens or, you know, uh, hydroponics in Kenya uh, that you reach at the end, you know, because not uh, everybody adopting it uh, will uh, n succeed. But after indeed the training and the capacity building, you would have more. But I would like to have a sense of, uh, uh, you know, a kind of idea of uh, how much uh, successful they are or the people who adopt sust in a sustainable way, you know. Um, so are there uh, uh, comments, uh, questions? Yes, please. So I see one, two, in that order. Anybody else? Okay, we take this. Yes, three. Okay, so please, sir, we start with this first round. Uh, my name is Faya Bouquet and I'm from Liberia. I want to look at the context of nutrition, uh, specifically the question is to Inja from Nigeria. Are there any gaps between uh, producing crops hydroponically or in the, in the continuous than those ones that are produced on natural land by farmers? Also, uh, will you say that the level of successes you've had in Nigeria uh, is, is it the same in other ACP countries as well uh, with regards to the, the seasonal part and the climate change uh, issues in other countries as well? Thank you. Thank you very much, Witsokon uh, Tsabele, South African Embassy, Brussels. Um, I, I just wanted to thank you for the, the excellent presentations. Uh, I, I thought they were quite uh, thought-provoking and with, with lots of opportunity to, 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 to assist with uh, dealing with the question of youth unemployment in, 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 in Africa. And with that, I think Peter mentioned just one of the issues with regards to access to finance. But, but I thought p perhaps uh, you, you, you could help us understand what, what are the big constraints that young people uh, face in adopting uh, this sort of approaches in, 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 in agriculture? And, and in, in your own view, what, what is the way forward to ensure that we can replicate this th throughout uh, the, the African continent? Thank you. Thank you. There was a third one there. Yes, please go ahead. Moi, c'est Innocent Comparé de... My name is Innocent Comparé from Burkina Faso. I wish to thank you for this initiative. I learned quite a lot. I now see that in the presentations, they talked about plant production mainly. So did you try, did you experiment with, uh, anim with livestock production? Because I produce fish, I grow fish, and I've been closely watching at what has been, do, been done in Nigeria and the suburbs, particularly because Nigeria is a large producer of catfish in Africa. So, so those are very good examples to show how people can grow fish in towns and supply the urban market. Thank you very much. Is there any other? Merci beaucoup pour la question. Thank you very much for that question. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, I'm from Madagascar. My question is mainly about the water. Because we've highlighted urban agriculture, but from the start, I wanted to ask this question. Where 
What about the quality and quantity of water? Because when you're talking about cities, there's pollution. What measures need to be taken to ensure that the water is clean enough for agriculture? And also what needs to be done to provide the, the proper quantity of water for plant growth? Thank you very much. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much for those questions. I would now like to call upon the panelists uh, to answer the questions, or if anyone else wants to add something. Do you want to start, madam? Thank you, Isolina. First of all, I'd like to deal with your question regarding uh, success stories, how many, what percentage of success stories you've had. Well, the initial phase was simply training a few households on how to manage a mini garden. They just had a few tables, uh, but the process went beyond uh, the framework of the project because the city took ownership of the project and provided uh, areas for the project in 12 communes. So 12 centers were set up in 12 centers were set up in, and they were sort of demonstration centers where they had two professionals and they received technical support from the FAO experts. And they are there to answer in, or deal with any training issues, but these centers are also centers which, pro, which carry out mini garden production. They produce crops, and they give you the standard type of, of, of table to grow food on. When we saw that uh, the process was, uh, was growing very rapidly, we carried out an impact assessment over the past 10 years, and the percentages are the one I shared with you just now, 80% success, um, mainly done by women. We carried out an impact assessment as regards uh, food security and nutritional value. So we wondered whether many gardens really feeds families. Yes, partially. Because women have been working on the profitability of the product. For example, I have my, my tables with my with my vegetables and my salads, but but the women who are in the center, they grow spices, mint, parsley, in, so that they can order, so that they can sell their surplus, and and then the money is used for education in the in the family, educating the family. Well, I'll share the impact assessment report that we did, but it shows that as far as security, food security, and nutritional value, we have uh, 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 achieved our target. South Africa Embassy, uh, uh, specifically on the youth, you know, the constraints that youth face. Could Angel and Peter, as young people, so, uh, answer those, please? What, what are the main ones that you see for you, but of course uh, for, for African? Um, definitely, the gentleman from South Africa talked about access to finance, and I think whether traditional farming or, um, uh, for us, the type of farming that we're doing, hydroponic farming, um, when you have a situation where most of the youth don't own land, and in Nigeria, um, you need um, landed property to get loans. Um, so. It's very, very difficult to get uh, the type of capital. Sometimes you can get microfinance, but the um, amounts are so small sometimes. So it may help you to start up something small, but you want to be able to make enough. Um, sometimes the economics of scale aren't there. So being able to look at other assets, look at the equipment as an asset, things like that, that's helpful. Um, I think also in terms of the education. A lot of uh, people assume that you need to be highly educated to learn these things. The girls that I work with, all of them have secondary school degree or below. 
nobody has above um, that, but they're able to learn within one to three months, not only hydroponic farming, but fish farming, um, uh, chicken farming, and other things like that, mushroom farming, and also learn to train other people um, in our urban farmer network. So, so that's helpful. I think the other aspect um, is being able to make spaces available. So for example, um, our urban farmers network is looking to see how we can take spaces within the city that are empty, um, just to put it out there, the Belgium embassy in Nigeria has a plot of land that is available <laughs> and it's empty and they're not using it. So something like that would be beneficial for um, youth to be able to utilize that space, come together as a cooperative. Um, I think also in terms of organization, there's a uh, organization called um, Colesipi, um, that helps uh, um, farmers who want to be able to get their product to standard. And I mean, it's not just for exports, but I think when your product is to standard within the country, it means that being able to be taught about good agricultural practices, what you should and shouldn't do, what me gives you a quality product, you have now more access to um, grocery stores like ShopRite, um, Game, Spar, on a larger level, because they come, they check your facility. You know, one of the biggest burdens for me was was before I got the kitchen that I have now, the old kitchen was not ISO compliant. So we needed to make sure that we got a, um, what is it called, small loan from a friend. He invested that money. Um, and then we were able to get that kitchen and that helped us to repay that. So, so those are things. And I, I think the other gentleman from the UK mentioned crowdfunding. Um, what we, like for, in Nigeria, if the money's not coming to us, government may not provide the money, banks may not provide the money, the big men with all the money and nice cars may not provide the money, but if we can find ways to use technology to be able to crowdfund um, and get people who are interested in agriculture but don't want to actually do agriculture to invest in bite sizes, then it's something more palatable for a young upwardly mobile person to invest in a farmer when the data is there. So I think that other thing is uh, being able to have the data for people to be able to develop these kind of models. So. Okay, in order to devolve hydroponics to other African countries, one thing is about uh, the, the policy makers because it has taken me now one year to take hydroponics in Rwanda. Uh, we had uh, a very good agreement with the Lord Agriculture Board, but then uh, the custom for me to take the, uh, my organic hydroponics into, into Lord is becoming very hard because uh, there's no standard for that and it has to be gazetted at the fed thing. And then also to take my inert media to Rwanda. Although now we did try to use uh, organic uh, local local materials. Uh, the other thing is being a new technology, it has to have uh, demo farms. You first of all you start with the demo farm so that the youth can come and learn. And then uh, involve youth in the whole food chain. Because it's only hydroponics by itself cannot be able to help the youth because they also need to have access to the market so that at least they can have access to the microfinance. Because as I said, that the reason why uh, banks are not coming is because they are not sure whether this youth are going to, to sell the produce. And you know hydroponics has a predictable, uh, guaranteed supply of food throughout the year because it does not depend on lean fed agriculture. So it's very ideal. It can also even grow hubs for export or also for, for, for the local. So it's only that we have the demo farms, we get the use trained, and then we create the good business model for them. That's the only way I think they will be able to, to have the youth come in Africa to be able to adapt the urban hydroponics. Thank you very much. I don't know what, uh, yes, please, Angel. I wanted to be able to talk about um, that, that aspect of quality of water and then uh, also nutritional gaps. I'll kind of lump them uh, together. Um, in terms of water quality, you, when you're looking at, um, I think we had this conversation earlier about having farmers that come from rural areas that are using spaces available to grow. Um, in Nigeria, sometimes you'll see some farmers on the um, side of the highway, the, the expressway, um, farming locally. Um, the water that's coming from uh, runoff or coming from the sewage and things like that, you're not able to control um, the quality of that water. Um, I think that's where training needs to come in to be able to, and not just training, but helping them to understand why 
it would be bad for them would help them to understand why it would be bad for other people because sometimes they're growing things that they're not even eating so you know at the end of the day them to be, un- be able to understand but with what we, it is that we're doing we have a closed loop system so the water that when we started we didn't have any access to water where i was so we have these guys called marwa they carry water um, in the neighborhood for people who don't have um, potable water in their neighborhood. And you buy it for 50 naira for a 50 gallon, um, uh, 50, sorry, 50 liter um, jug, right? And you use that. So we would buy what we need and have that cycling through our system when we first started. Now we have a borehole because we've been able to um, make enough revenue to invest in in a borehole, but in places where you're in the city, but there's no infrastructure development for access to water, um, those those are things that uh, we face. But being able to make sure with our hydroponic um, farming that our water is controlled, the water source is clean, the nutrients that we're using are um, good. And then also in terms of nutrients, um, you asked about the nutritional gap versus traditional farming. And one thing I love about, I come from a science background. And so the reason that I was drawn to um, hydroponic farming is because of the fact that it's so driven by science. Um, it's so driven by looking at what the, looking at agriculture as a science and saying, what are the variables that help to give you an optimal plant? What are the, um, Um, uh, nutrients that come from the soil. You can't say, oh, it's just the soil that the plant needs, but there's something inside the soil. That's why we still have bad soils in certain countries where you have soil, but the plants are not growing. You're not getting good yield. There's a reason why people are using fertilizers. So I, I... I'm seeing in Nigeria high use of fertilizers. So I feel more secure using um, organic hydroponic um, production or aquaponic production than using um, um, uh, or eat, than eating products that may be used with high levels of fertilizers that people are not even regulating and they're coming into the country in, in funny, funny ways anyway. So, so for me, um, I see the nutritional um, value being that the, the customer is able to trace where their food is coming from, when it was produced, how it was produced, and with what. So, so for us, that becomes, and, and our customers come to our facility, they can see what it is that is growing. Um, and then I think there was another question about animal livestock. Yes, we're doing um, uh, chickens, we're doing uh, fish. We did catfish and tilapia. We failed on the tilapia. Um, we had very, very small fish, um, but the catfish was very easy and there was market there. Um, the chicken was very, very helpful to us also because at some time we were testing out using compost tea, which was just liquefied compost in our systems versus um, uh, aquaponic system versus um, a uh, organic uh, fertilizer um, system, and so we've we've been able to see how that can be uh, beneficial as well. So, yeah. Thank you very much. And I have to say for our colleague from Burkina Faso that indeed we could yes. just bring some cases, but the animal and uh, aquaponics is very very important. So I hope that in uh, another opportunity we can bring some of those uh, cases. Uh, if any of the speakers, and can give you the floor, and any of the others want to just give the last words before our interpreters run away, please, Eng. Yeah, just to add on the issue of quality of water, because I want to prevent that you think that you can only do urban agriculture with uh, potable water sources. That would be very uh, scarce and very expensive. Um, While in in many African cities there are a lot of vegetable growers that use wastewater. Um, Just to give the example of of Bulawayo, the, the, the city government already for 20 years supplies domestic wastewater to a large um, uh, scheme where hundreds of farmers are growing with wastewater without any problem. What is uh, required is to do uh, proper training in how to manage wastewater when you use it in agriculture. Um, there is a lot of documentation on, on this kind of cases and, and guidelines that you can use Uh, how to safely manage wastewater in agriculture. Um, So don't go only for fresh potable water. The other thing is there is a lot of uh, treated wastewater uh, that comes from the plants that just is is disposed in rivers and and, uh, open sources. It could be reused with very little effort. uh, If water managers uh, in the city would think about agriculture rather than just about potable water supply to industry and, and households. Thank you. 
Oui, oui. Yes. oui je voudrais juste hein, répondre à la préoccupation de... I just wanted to deal with the question raised by the man from Burkina Faso who talked about animal production. Well, in, with our mini gardens, we don't do much animal production. It's a very, it's very small, but we have mini livestock farming as well. That's a new term. So you have a, a pen or cage. And we can uh, grow, we can breed chickens or fowl. And then on, on another shelf, you have a mini garden. So it's just another practical way to, talk, to deal with uh, animal and plant production. So that's what we did uh, most recently in our project, and it's now being developed, and the future looks promising for it. So we, so we have uh, a blend of mini gardens and mini animal production. Yes, we also have a series of, uh, uh, of examples which you can see in the documentation, but we can provide the Burkina Faso delegate with some more information. Well, first of all, I wish to thank uh, the interpreters on behalf of the organizers, the European Commission, the ACP and the CTA and the Concord Group. This is something we forget about very often, but it's very important. And I wish to thank all the presenters. I found they were, ex I, they were excellent, and they gave us various views of the issue. Uh, as we said at the start, it is complex, it is multidisciplinary, and in one day's session, you can't cover everything. But I hope that uh, that's given you enough information information. Well, for those who are not already involved in the sector, well, I hope that gave you the chance to learn a bit more. If you have other experiences to share with us, uh, we'll be happy to hear them. As far as I'm concerned, uh, well, I can't uh, uh, give you make the I can't make the concluding remarks without making a few recommendations, which would come out from some of you. The CTA and the European Commission has, and the ACP, as we said this morning, we are very interested in job creation for youth, and it's a very promising sector. It can involve agriculture, IT technologies, uh, e-trade. Use, the use of apps well to attract youth to agriculture and cut down on migration the, when you can't uh, have time frames very long time frames the, the cities need fresh produce we stress that point so I think that one of the things one of the practical things which can come out of today's session is to do some sort of mapping of the success stories for the youth and for young entrepreneurs, as we've met here. And uh, you can find them everywhere. You, they can talk about how much they, they can talk about how much they produce, what was their business models, what they've been able to manage by in urban agriculture. This is something we can do. But uh, with that we can share experiences and uh, we can uh, do a scaling up through that. Now we talked about the, the policy framework, the regulatory framework for land use. That's necessary as well, particularly regarding, uh, and we also need to talk about support for uh, those involved in urban agriculture. And this morning, we also saw something very important, and that's the new promising markets. We mentioned that in, in for Europe and for Africa, for example, or, or biotourism, or, or selling organic products, providing them in hotels. Well, I buy organic products. Um, I get it directly from the farm, so it's a very promising sector. Of course, what was uh, stressed a lot
lot and what is critical in, in, in this sort of area is, uh, is having the public and private sector work together. Everyone should benefit. Uh, things are not working in traditional agriculture, but maybe we need to further explore and see how the private sector can help. Now, this has been repeated often. Well, when we talk about youth, we, 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 we also include women. Uh, even the older ones like me, well, women are very important stakeholders in, in urban agriculture, and they require special attention. So these are just a few comments I wanted to add. I wanted to thank you on behalf of the organizers once again. If it's the first time that you've come for a briefing, well, I would like to tell you it, it happens every two months, more or less. The next one will be in June. You'll get the exact date online or by email, and that will be on agriculture as a key sector for fragile states, states um, which are being rebuilt or post-conflict states. We think that that's important, but we, uh, we, we have the same, it's in the same mindset, things that work on the ground. So thank you very much. This is one of the first briefings where we, uh, well, we're always running late, so I think we are within our time in this session. I hope to see you at the next briefing. Uh, thank you very much. See you soon.